Hello everyone, Mike with Spray Jones, and I want to go over selecting a spray foam contractor. Um, there's a number of points that you should be looking for, thinking about when making a decision, and it'll help you separate out a lot of the good from the bad. And a lot of these are carryover points that would apply to any industry, so I'm going to include those as well as industry specific to the spray foam industry. Starting off with number one, do they answer the phone and return phone calls? If you're having a lot of trouble getting a hold of somebody and they're not returning messages in a prompt fashion, and I would say prompt is same day or within 24 hours of the first phone call, uh, you might want to rethink about whether you want to be dealing with these people. Now, sometimes people are up north, they're out of cell coverage, they're down south, wherever it happens to be, and they, they are not available but the good contractor should be checking their messages on a regular basis and trying to get some sort of way to get back to you um, the second point is do they take the time to talk to you um, some guys and girls are rammy they don't really want to listen um, you seem like you're bothering them they should be engaging and wanting to have a discussion if they don't um, and they're this way multiple times when you call them or talk to them then you might want to rethink it right away third point is do they listen and grasp the job um, if you're having difficulty explaining to them discussing to them making clear to them what you're trying to achieve or why you're trying to achieve it and then once you do have a discussion about it if they can't give you clear start dates uh, when they would be on site, how many days it would take. If they, if they cannot see through to what it's going to take to finish it and give you some sort of an idea on timeline or what their schedule is going to be like. If they're like, oh, I don't know, i got to finish this project. I'll wait until I'm done and then we can talk in a couple of weeks when I'm done. When they can't give you sort of definitive answers, that means they're, they're living day to day, week to week, and you're not going to want them on your job because they're going to carry through that sort of Jerky jerky attitude. Fourth point, can they explain things clearly to you? So if they have difficulty articulating and speaking, that doesn't necessarily make them a bad contractor, but I've I found that if they can't explain things to you and can't articulate what they're gonna try to do, then maybe it's better to go with somebody that can. Um, this to me is a function of being able to govern your thoughts, govern your instructions to your people, what you're going to do, and then making sure that the client is at ease. So if they can't do that, then find somebody that can. Fifth point, do they understand the building code? Do they understand the rules and regulations and the authorities having jurisdiction? Do they understand what the enforcement is going to be in their area? If they have no clue about the building code, if they're not up to date, if they're not up to date with legislation and jurisdictions, then walk away. Uh, they're going to get you in a jam, in trouble, and they're not going to be able to help. And worse yet, you're going to be the one having to get educated and educate them. Sixth, do they have a mindset of achieving a set goal for quality? Like, we're always saying, what are you trying to do? What outcome do you want? How do you want it to work? If they don't have an idea of what to do and how to do it on the job and what needs to also happen for it to function as a complete system, walk away. Um, many times people have asked us to do things that isn't going to work, it isn't going to look right, it isn't going to be functional. We know that they're not going to be happy with it in the end and we explain to them why. Rather than just saying, well, you asked for it, we did it, we knew that wasn't going to work, but we did it anyhow. That's not professionalism. Seven. Um, are they the right size for your project? Now this is really a, a legitimate question. Um, sometimes you've got way too big a contractor coming in to do a small job and they're just not going to be able to give you the customer service and they don't have the right equipment. But most of the time I'm seeing this with too small, um, especially when they have small equipment very few staff, maybe they're on the tools themselves. You gotta, you want to be careful that you're not building a large cabin or house or commercial building and you've awarded it to a one truck guy. 
Uh, the reason being is they've got no backup, no assistance. If they get sick, if they get hurt, if they get overwhelmed with something, you've got very little to no recourse. So you really want to vet out their size compared to what your project is going to be. Um, you can do an enormous amount of work with two and three trucks. Um, mom and pop shops are okay for small projects and that's a good way to go but when you're getting into good medium sized jobs you're going to want to think twice you want to go with somebody that's got two or even three units uh, number eight do they have a good info uh, about them on the internet now this is a little bit of a, a difficult i know in the age of facebook most people have a facebook page but just consider this it takes effort time and money to build a website to make these kinds of videos that I'm doing, to have proper email addresses. Uh, if it takes very little effort to build a web page on Facebook or have a Facebook presence, and, and that can be a good way to go. But I'm looking for something more in a contractor. I'm looking about how have they built their brand? How are they uh, clothing themselves in the digital age? Are they up to date on technology and websites and the content that they're putting in there is the content that they've got in the website personalized or is it just cut and paste cut and paste generic stock images um, stock sayings are they are they plagiarizing even have you seen the information that they're putting out to be the same on multiple websites if you do it shows you that you're dealing with somebody that really isn't all that personalized I've had my information plagiarized I've had it outright stolen I've had lots of people try to emulate us. I've even had lots of contractors try and name their companies very similar names to us. All of that in an attempt to try and clone us uh, towards themselves. So if they don't have a strong presence and good information out there, it's usually an indication that that kind of stuff doesn't matter and it probably car uh, carries over into their work. Number nine, do they request plans, picks, and specs? And... Um, do they require assistance with this stuff? Like, how many times people rattle off pricing and they don't even have a full idea of the project yet? Like, I've had people send me a floor plan of a commercial building or a residential building and then said, here, can you get me a price? Well, it's one page. Well, no, I can't get you a price. I don't know what the height of the walls are. I don't know what the elevations look like. I don't know what the roof line looks like. So if they're not asking for a lot of information, um, if you give them one or two pages and they've rattled off a, a $72,000 quote on two pages of information, you, you look out. Like, I have found that professional contractors on both sides, people that are professional that want to hire me, uh, are forthcoming with their plans. A major warning sign to me always is when somebody cannot get plans to me and the plans are incomplete or they have no clue as to why. I've had to ask them two and three times, can you send... Uh, the upper elevations can you send the lower elevations and they're still rolling their eyes at me that to me is one I might not want to work for them but if you have somebody that isn't even caring about that information walk away because you're not into guessing guessing is going to lead to we had no idea back charges uh, they're going to play the game on you number 10 do they discuss the needs of the job with you or do they only talk on square foot rates now we have been trained in society to think in square footage or square meters. We buy our houses this way, uh, cabin trailers, uh, flooring, uh, building materials, everything's sold on the square foot, square meter. So I get it. I get it. It's sort of a language that's out there that gives us some sort of a grid to judge what we're getting. But it's completely irrelevant when it comes to all of the personalized things that can be built. I really don't care what the square foot rate is to do an eight foot high wall that's 27 feet when you're asking me to come in and do a 22 foot great room wall that is 97 feet long like the rates are going to change are you out of town am I having to stay overnight do I have to send my guys for multiple visits with multiple different products the square foot rate is irrelevant. You as the buyer should not be asking what's your square foot price. You should be asking about here's my project, where do you think my budgets need to be at? And then get them to explain it. If they're just rattling off two bucks, three bucks, four bucks, who's going to determine the footage? Are there deductions? You know, there's way too many open-ended questions and those types of things. Number 11, do they discuss preparation with you? Like if they will not tell you how to get prepared 
what you're going to need to do, how you're going to need to build it, how you're going to need to change it, what are you going to need to modify. If they don't have a sheet that they're going to give you, if they never come out to site, if they aren't willing to have multiple conversations with you, your electrician, your framer, once you've hired them, or, or getting close to hiring them, um, walk away. Like, how are you supposed to read their mind as to what they need? They're just going to show up and then say, oh, this job isn't ready, and then want to back charge you a call-out charge? No, pros walk you through getting ready. They, they educate you on every single aspect. And then if you don't do your job, well, then that's a different story. Uh, number 12 is a big one. Do they have a safety program? Now, you might think, what on earth does that really matter? I just want to get some foam done. It matters massively. Here in Canada, Workers' Compensation Board and the, the rights that protect the worker and the employers mandate that you have a written safety program. Now, that doesn't mean that many do, but that's what the law is. You can be charged. And usually you get charged when there's been an accident and they do an investigation and then they find out you don't even have a fall protection plan. If you do not have a contractor with a written safety program that has fall protection, um, respiratory awareness, um, confined space entry, like it's the mark of professionalism to know how are they going to take care of their people and what are they going to do about industry standards, industry safety standards, industry awareness, it needs to be written down. If it's not written down, it doesn't exist. And then that means that they don't care about what their people do and their people don't care about the impact that they have on others. You don't want somebody like that on site. Number 13 is really simple, insurance. And make sure they've got a lot of it. You don't need this until everything goes wrong. Insurance on the equipment, the trucks, the trailers, and then commercial general liability insurance. And folks, prices have gone up uh, on everything you're building nowadays. A million bucks doesn't go very far. Two million bucks doesn't go very far. Uh, we can't even step a foot on a commercial site without $5 million. So uh, ask them what they have for insurance because if they're on your site and you're the general contractor, it's your house, okay? If there's a fire, if there is damage done, the first insurance making the claim is yours, and then your insurance company is going to have to go after them on the liability. That is a lousy time to find out that they're insufficiently insured, or they've been lying or something and they haven't been keeping it up to date. You don't want to find out the hard way. Uh, 14. What are their certifications? What do they hold? Do they have fall protection? Do they have confined space entry? Are they up to date with all of their certifications with their suppliers? Uh, do they have any extra special um, tickets that they're going to need for this, like a lift ticket to get in a mobile lift? You think that doesn't matter? It absolutely does. Um, you can't go and rent equipment and have equipment on site and then have somebody that they've just pulled out of labor ready and put them in a lift in a bucket. That's unprofessional. So you want to know what's their certification. Uh, 15, how long have they had staff with them? I use this as a business to business. I use this as a gauge of who I'm dealing with. Good people keep good people. High turnover is for a reason. Either the employer is hard to work with or he doesn't want to pay or he's seeking out low level people that aren't going to make a career. I don't seek out um, rolling stones. I'm not interested in somebody who's just trying out foam for a little while. I've got people that have been working for me for 10 years. I've got people that have worked for me for seven and six. It's a badge of honor that they have stayed and that I've made a place for them to stay. And there's a relationship. Stability brings professionalism and quality to the job site. If they've just got a bunch of guys, and, and, and don't fall victim to this. We have an accumulated uh, level of experience of 50 years in the spray foam industry. How did you, did you round up a hundred guys that all have uh, six months experience so you have 50 years or do you actually have somebody that's been in the business for 50 years like I have seen these numbers thrown out we have an accumulated experience of 33 years in the spray foam industry no you don't what's the most experience that any one of your guys has oh uh, five okay that's it that's all you have you have five years at best in the industry don't be fooled by these types of things uh, 16 what are the products that they install 
you want to be able to research it. If you're dealing with some obscure, off-the-shelf, uh, out the backwater place that's been discontinued, that's been in a multiple bunch of lawsuits, that's been in the news, um, do your research. What are they installing? Who are they dealing with? I told you before in other videos, deal with multinationals, deal with large corporations, deal with somebody that has a pedigree. Find out what the products are so that you can research them. If you've never heard of it before, you might want to start thinking twice. I mean, I know everybody's got to get their start, but in this industry, it takes billions of dollars to develop high-grade products over many, many years. You're not going to just develop this on a whim. So you want to look at the larger corporations that have put the time and the money into it. It is definitely a way to go for safety. And that leads into 17, what are the warranties? If they can't warranty the product, tell you what the product's going to be, when warranties apply, when warranties don't, run the other way. Small level companies are not interested in anything other than what we call the tail light warranty, which is buy out of here, we're not coming back. Uh, warranty is a big issue, and there should be some written information, especially if you can get it through third parties. Like in Canada, there has to be a mandatory third party warranty association uh, that the suppliers uh, are going through otherwise they don't want the client having to sue or hold the bag on costs so these are things to ask about uh, 18 is a really good one uh, what kind of equipment do they have you know how many times that I've seen where a little shrimpy truck and trailer can't get into the site or can or big huge semi equipment and they're gonna come to your acreage and tear your place up like can you actually get backed in, driven in, turned around, set up? Do the equipment that they have, is it been put together by a bunch of auctioneers? Like, I have seen some of the most hodgepodge, junky equipment running around down the highway. These guys have gotten this and one of those and two of these, and they're, you know, it's all held together by a couple of bolts and some chewing gum. Now, you want to have a professional looking set of equipment that somebody's proud to actually put their name on that's another thing pros and professional companies have no problem making their rigs into rolling billboards if they're not going to put their phone number their web address and their name all over this thing if it's just some smeared up old hand spray bomb paint job truck and trailer with crayon written on the side as to what their name is you want to think long and hard about getting those guys on your site in fact i had a guy that was working for me one time he had a really beat up truck and uh, it was just his, it was just his junk truck. But he said to me, you know, oh no problem. I'll just load my truck up with a bunch of supplies, and you know, I'll run it down to the guys here. And we were on a commercial job site. And I said, no, I, I don't want it. I said that truck doesn't reflect the image of the corporation. I don't want it on site. Uh, in fact, in Canada, a bunch of the mine sites, uh, they have regulations on this. Your vehicle can only be. Uh, four years old or it has to be newer than that that's the maximum um, they want to see new equipment so I know this can sound a little prejudicial uh, but it is a reflection on it's not did they take an old hot rod truck and fix it up and put their name on it that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about you know what I'm talking about I'm talking about something that came off the bottom of the ocean and it shouldn't be on the road and are they are they trying to use it on a day-to-day -day basis number 19 can they explain physics and the product and the overall system to you like you would be surprised how many people have no clue how foam is supposed to work how it's supposed to work in the overall environment they have taken a couple of classes a couple of courses they are just stringing it together but they cannot explain it and actually they, they really can't understand it these are people that should be working for somebody else not running their own company okay so can they explain the physics of what's going on and why and how and right away that point number 19 that will remove 90 percent of the contractors out there 90 percent of the people cannot explain the physics of what's going on and why they they subscribe to myths they subscribe to um, innuendo and they do not have the facts of what's going on and the last point is number 20. If all of this has gone well for you, they should have earned your trust. Are you getting a written quote? Are you getting your information written up front? And are they going to be taking a deposit 
and how are they going to be setting up payment? Um, if they are not giving you a written quote, look out. If they are writing a quote in a vague set of requirements, there should be a detailed scope of work explaining everything. Otherwise, you leave yourself open to uh, back charges. Are they taking deposits? Pros take deposits. Don't be afraid of deposits, folks. Um, I use deposits all the time to find out who's serious. Um, when there's money involved, you've got more legal rights. I mean, I've had a lot of people phone me up and say, well, I had this guy hired, and he, he, he said he was coming on Tuesday, and he never showed up. And I'm like, well, did you get a written quote? Well, he kind of told me what it was going to be. Did you get a deposit? No. Well, there you go. That's why you're phoning me. So we're going to give you a written quote. This is exactly what it's going to be, and I want X amount up front, and then we're coming. And then here's how you're going to do payment after. Here's how we're going to invoice you. Here's what it's going to look like. We're going to send it to you email, and you can do an e-transfer. You can do a credit card. You can do a check, okay? That is the mark of professionalism, you know, on both sides of the fence. So I hope this helps. If you apply these 20 steps to anything that you're doing, especially in the spray foam hiring area, it's going to work out for you. And you're going to be able to sort through and sift the, uh, the amateurs from the professionals. If you haven't hit like and subscribe, do so. And I'll keep you updated with good information in the future. Thank you.